Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Learning Bigfoot. Today we have our special, amazing guest, the one and only Gary Spikes Jr. from P3 Productions with us. We are so honored to have him here and our co-host, Zach from Rude Expeditions. What's going on, guys? Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, I see Laura's in the house. Um, Zach's in the house. <laughs> Ronnie's in the house. Uh, I know I missed a couple people scrolling, but... Um, we also want to reiterate for all the all the viewers in the chat and everything else, we do want to be able for, to have you ask questions. Just make sure you hold your questions till the end of the show so we can go ahead and uh, address each of those as we go. Um, in the meantime, we're going to just be drilling Gary with a ton of questions and having fun. Because that's what we do. This is going to be fun. I know this is going to be a great episode. You guys are going to love this one for sure. Y'all uh, talking about blasting the airways i probably ought to send the link to my father that's what i'm saying i'm really glad that you got to got to meet my dad I, I sure hated it that i missed all you guys you know down there but i was dealing with some health issues and work issues and uh but uh he my dad spoke very highly of you and that's oh really uh he don't act surprised. Every <laughs> single person you ever meet speaks highly of you. <laughs> stop, putting well, on, <laughs> stop trying to butter everybody up. <laughs> I'm, just me. I'm just me. I don't know. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Gary. I was just calling no, Zach uh, out. <laughs> my, my dad's a very, uh, how would we say, very hard individual. And uh, Zach was actually, my dad's in the 60s, but he tromps the woods on a regular basis with me and stuff like that. And he was very impressed with uh, Zach chasing him around <laughs> down there with him and Tex and stuff. And, and like I said, he, he was he spoke very highly. I mean, it kind of made me feel bad that I was that I missed it. You know, of course, anytime I miss a chance going to the woods, it's it's a, a sad thing for me. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's going to be more to opportunities and more times because, as a lot of people know, and if you don't know, I'm going to tell you right now, Zach is 100% full-time focusing on his channels and focusing on the growth of Rooted Expeditions mm -hmm. and his other channels. And um, so he's planning on doing a lot of traveling. He's planning oh, on working with a lot of people. So you, uh, Zach, you come right on up here. And I'll put you up and feed you good, and we'll put you in some woods that might make you want to go back home. <laughs> oh. <laughs> make me want to go home sometimes. <laughs> and Zach, I'll, I'll follow behind you. So when you start going whoop, whoop, uh, I, I, I can watch you run first, okay? <laughs> My, everybody that goes out in the woods with me, they always say they don't have to outrun Bigfoot. They just outrun me because I can't, I'm kind of crippled up. I don't run <laughs> real <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. You know, to bring uh, apples. Tex scared me really bad out there. I will say that. Uh, I thought he was sitting at the chair, you know, at the camp. And uh, I guess he kind of wandered off to the edge of camp towards where the woods are. And he goes, whoa, whoa, <laughs> like doing a call out, you know. It, I literally, my heart sunk and I froze. I was like, oh my God, there's a big foot behind me. I was like, what do I do? I looked and there was text because I literally thought he was sitting right there. I just wasn't paying attention and I uh, literally scared the living crap out of me. I, I was like, oh my God. Where'd y'all camp at? Um, Down there by my dad? Yeah. Yeah. Right there in Brown Springs. Uh, yeah. Down there where my dad had the trailer and the. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. Right that there, area, yeah. the last time we was down there, if y'all hadn't catch, you know, ours and tech show, we got circled for mm -hmm. all night long for two nights I had one run through camp we you know uh we literally stood there and watched i shine looking back at us all three of us i had went over to relieve myself and seen it and called my dad and tex over and uh, with no and with no light just the ambient light we watched uh about nine foot off the ground i shine doing this looking at us and you could see it turn its head like this because one eye would drop back for about Ooh, 10 wow. minutes that wow. area is that area is crawling. That sounds definitely crazy. Now, um, we we kind of jumped into this a little bit, and I, I just kind of want to reiter reiterate because we have a, a few more people in in the chat. So, 
Um, this channel is specifically about learning Bigfoot. So we are coming in as green as you can get. We don't know anything beyond what we've heard on movies and, you know, from the past previous shows that we've had. So we, we're trying to learn more about not just the anomaly itself, but the effect it makes on people and also the keys and the cues to watch out for. So mm -hmm. um, when, when you're on this channel, just be aware that we're asking questions that some people have probably heard a hundred times, but um, the, the answers differ from time to time. There's always a little slight difference of what should we look for? You know, what should we bring? How should we prepare? And so um, we are going to be, or we so far we're scheduled to go to Florida in November to film with uh, Bigfoot Odyssey's yep. uh, Carrie, and we are trying to learn as much as we can before we get there. So at least we're a little bit more prepared. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for hanging out with us, and thank you for talking with us. That's a good question. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know where we're going with that. Okay. So, so Gary, what? Um, will you take us back to um, your first experiences uh, with Bigfoot? Ooh. What was your first exposure to Bigfoot? Was it was my it first Legends curiosity? Did you have an experience right off the bat? I, our, as I had told y'all before, our uh, family has been on our property a long time and in the area for a long time. And so the, the old stories, and we have a lot of First Nations blood in us, predominantly Cherokee. And uh, the old nation, the First Nation stories was always told to us, you know, and I, I it never consciously hit my mind until I was, I think, about 12 years old. And me and my grandparents had went to Colorado and was driving. My grandfather was retired by the time I, you know, hit my teenagers and they was raising me. Y'all hear me talk a lot about senior. Uh, we we was kind of estranged for a while, and then now we're very close. You know, for the ever since I became an adult. But uh, make a long story short, we was driving around the, the backside of Black Mesa in Colorado, like and I like I said, I was like twelve years old, and mm -hmm. and uh, it was just coming up night, and was kind of cutting around a, a logging road. We had an old four wheel drive Ford, and something stood up on one side of the road and ran to the downhill side. And it took like three steps across a two track, which, uh, uh, you know, I was saying what it is. I'm not for sure. And I asked my grandfather and he said, we just don't talk about them things. Hmm. So that kind of caught my attention. And, uh, <laughs> you know, being raised up out in the country being, I mean, and, and here's the, here's the kicker for us. We, uh, have realized that we had a lot more activity in our past by learning the behaviors and, and talking to you, folks like y'all about evidence and learning what they're doing. Well, me and my father now over the past five years have literally realized that we had a lot of activity in our childhood that we didn't know we had. Mm. We didn't until we got that skill set to be able to ascertain what is what we call, I call Sasquatch and what people call other animals. But we had always had, you know, being raised on the farm, you hunt and fish and always, always out doing stuff and we'd have little you know things happen like another thing early on the farm we always uh my family always raised two gardens my grandmother did one on one side of the lane that goes down into the pasture and one on the other side of the and by the time i come along my grandmother's already you know by the, my earliest memories my grandma and grandfather are in their 50s and 60s uh they was 47 when i was born my father or grandfather was sorry and uh I always asked her, I said, why do we, and she never would let me hoe that garden over there. I was always hoeing the main garden and she, that was, she said that was her garden, her private garden. It's kind of weird how she said that. And uh, I asked her why she did that at a later date. And uh, she says, that's for the forest folk. Hmm. And uh, me and dad, you know, me and dad, we talk about that even now, you know, it's like, we didn't realize that, you know, dad was even an adult and, and didn't realize it until, you know, we got up and learned more. So, that kind of started me. Uh, I spent most of my young adult life. I joined the military at the age of 17, but I spent uh, from the time I was like 12 to that was the reason we was in Colorado. We was going up for a program called Upward Bound. It's a survival school. They've got it in Utah, too, actually in Ogden. But uh, 
uh, they literally teach you for 30 days how to do wilderness survival, you know, young men and ladies and groups. And then they, uh, they teach you for 30 days. Then they give you a pen, knife, a map, a compass, a canteen, and a backpack and a sleeping bag and say, you got three days to cover from 50 mile stretch mm. in Colorado. But what they don't tell you is they're keeping an eye on you. But so I did survival school, survival school. Then I joined the military, became a combat veteran, a uh, U.S. Army Ranger. Uh, it just kind of planned, you know, it's just what I love to do, spend time in the woods. Mm. And uh, that led into the more time I spent in the woods, you know, traveling with the military, you know, South Fort Campbell, Kentucky, Fort Benning, Georgia, Fort Bragg, you know, even up in y'all's area, you know, uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, you know, different areas and hearing different things and being in, in the survival and the camping community, you know, Bigfoot is is a part of it. You know, it's it's just one of them things that I've always taken for nature, you know, natural. Yeah. You'll find that I'm a very natural Bigfooter. I don't, I, I believe in the woo because I'm a paranormal researcher myself. But I, every experience that I've had so far, so far with what that I could ascertain as Bigfoot has been very natural. Wait, uh, real, real quick, you say... Let me stop you there because we really haven't touched on this uh, and i've heard this a lot but for 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 people that don't know what the what the woo is what is that the i don't like the word and it's funny because the the folks that i work for spaced out radio he uses woo all the time and he, he hates squatch he likes sasquatch or bigfoot you know uh to woo Woo to me is the spiritual aspect and the spiritual abilities or the paranormal abilities of Sasquatch. Hmm. You know, uh, walking through walls, orbs, uh, walking through portals, hmm. uh, disappearing, cloaking. To me, that's what I call woo. Uh, the self ambient eye shine, you know, unexplainable self ambient eye shine, mind speak. Uh, anything that's out of the ordinary that an animal, a normal animal, would not, would not do in a natural sense. Okay. okay. Thank you. No, I'm glad you explained that because I was wondering too. So thank you for that. I mean, I, I tell people all the time, is it not paranormal or abnormal enough to have a eight to 10 foot tall bipedal five foot across the shoulders, hairy hominid running around in the United States and all over the world being reclusive against us as homo sapiens? You know, it's, it's one of them deals. They're paranormal enough for me. And, mm. but, but <laughs> Brown Springs. Down there with Tex and, and them. I mean, I, I, I can honestly say that I had some experiences down there that that we knew that there was what we're thinking was Sasquatch in the area. But I'm leaning towards that there's multiple things in the woods. Hmm. That, that, would, that would make a lot of sense, though. I mean, because if just one can be elusive, how many else, how many Absolutely. other things can be elusive out yeah, there, too? Yeah, that is Absolutely. true. It just that, that really makes me start to think now that you said that um, I was kind of processing my CPU is a little slow today, so <laughs> I process a little slower. Um, <laughs> let, let me run. Some, let me run something by you. I, I've I've had one class A sighting, as I told you all, and most people can catch it on my channel and I've said it on a few shows. I've seen one face to face at 18 inches, literally like horror movie closeness, like right here. And believe you me, I reacted just like you would in a horror movie and probably worse because they ain't going to show what I did in, in on a movie. It well, may be a comedy, but uh, <laughs> uh, let's just say that I wasn't smelling the best when I left out of there. But uh, make a long story short, every, <laughs> Zach caught it. You actually listened to my... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll admit it. You know, I don't care what people say. When you see these things, that's how much it rocks fear. you to your core. How much fear it puts into you. Absolutely. And folks, I'm a I'm a decorated veteran, combat vet, and I I had already been researching. I had that sight in in 2016, and I'd already been researching for 20 so years. You are, so you are well aware. I went there looking for him, mm. and I found him. I see. And he scared the hell out of me. Kind of sounds like he found you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, was, yeah. I mean, it, we we literally had went up a hill and got followed out of the woods for like three quarters of a mile. And oh, wow. they wanted to stay until daylight to go up and see if they could find tracks. And I stayed with them. And because, uh, and, uh, of course, me being a tracker, we hadn't even got into that. But uh, 
I was sleeping in my truck and uh, something woke me up in the middle of the night and I was laying across the seat of bench seat of my truck and I looked up and that rascal was looking in the driver's side window at me like this. And hmm. I screamed and lost all control of my bodily functions for about 15 to 20 seconds. And, and uh, when I come back to and, and, and the kicker for me and I, and I tell people all the time, I figure it's 15 to 20 seconds. It could have been two to three as far as I know. All I know is, you know, time stood still. You know, I, I was not worried about looking at my watch. Right. right. <laughs> uh, I finally got kind of a somewhat semblance of control and I went to reach for my pistol. And, and I do remember specifically, it looks at me, kind of looks at the motion of the pistol and he stands up and takes off. <laughs> Gone. Mm. Mm. But he squatted down to look in that window and that window was an 88 model Chevy three quarter ton four wheel drive. The top of the door is six feet off the ground. My goodness. <laughs> wow. That kind of gives you an idea of size and mass. Well, let me, let me throw another oh, one at my you. Goodness. You see the box on the camera where my camera's sitting. Oh, uh huh. Window on a truck. The side window of a truck is 36 inches from the in front post to the back pillar on a single cab. I could see his right shoulder through the back glass and his left shoulder through the windshield. So he was wider across substantially than that cab of that truck was long. Holy crap. I guarantee I would have lost control of my bodily functions at that moment, too. I, I probably it. would have, too. I mean, I'm surprised holy you didn't have a dang heart attack, man, because when, when Tex did his rah, my heart stopped. Uh, <laughs> Gosh, man, I can't just say that it, it took me. And, and once again, now we hadn't got into my history on catch that on my channel. I mean, I am, I'm a professional tracker. I've been for 16 years, actually 19 now with the department of corrections. I teach wilderness survival. I teach primitive life skills. I teach land nav. I mean, we do it as, as we traveled the nation for almost a year doing it with pathfinder system. But this changed me completely. It took me four years to go back to that site. Mm. And I went back with your next week's guest, Shane Carpenter, my brother from another mother. I love him to death. Uh, and him and Randy Arrington, we went back. My, my father went with us, but he would not go back to the, I didn't want him going to the actual site mm. uh, because I knew I'd be pretty shaken up. And yeah. I'm telling you, this, this, this big redneck was, was shaking like a leaf and crying when we got back there and I relived that moment. I can imagine. You're talking, you're talking almost therapy type stuff to, and, and it, it drives, I can't say that drives me nuts. There's a lot, there's, there's gotta be some folks out here that sees these things differently than I do. Uh, you know, I hear of people that says they see them all the time and it doesn't scare them. And, and I hear people that communicate with them and it doesn't scare them. And, and I, I hold them people in either, uh, at, at a distance in a, in a high regard, they must be braver than I am. Uh, it could also be situational differences too. Um, yes. You you raise a lot of questions, and one one of the things that uh, as us talking about it from the ground level and trying to learn what we can, um, one of the things we're constantly looking for or constantly looking for information on is if we were walking through the woods. What are some telltale signs that we would want to watch for to indicate we may be encroaching on their territory or, or going through a path that they normally travel? What are some signs that we can keep an eye out for to know we're, we're somewhere where we may or may not should be along? Before I get into that, I'm going to say this, that everything that comes from this point forward is specifically my opinion and should be handled as such. It is not gospel. It's not church. It's not law. It's an interpretation over years of experiencing mm -hmm. and experiences of from taking from other people and from people teaching me. I, I believe in the very, I'm a tracker. The first thing you need to look for is tracks. I'm big into vocals, listen for vocals. Just in the last four or five years, I've really gotten into the X structures. I truly believe that there, there are telltale signs. There's, I know a lot of folks don't put a lot of stock into structures, but there are telltale signs that they're using structures to mark the territory. Hmm. Uh, honestly, if you're, if you're coming across a trail and you see a, a, 
a tree. And this is one of the big ones that I use. And I know people's on the, some people's going to disagree with me, and that's fine. You can disagree with me all you want. But when I see a, a big willow sapling or any kind of sapling broke off about five feet off the ground and stretched across the trail, that's one of the first things that I start, I start looking for more sign. Mm. For, for the simple fact, they have a tendency to do that, telling you, hey, don't come past here. You know, yeah. I see. Well, considering the amount of force it would take to break the tree at that point, you know, um, and especially if no other trees around there are, if they're not all snapped yeah. that way, it's just yeah. one one at random tree, that does raise questions. And and also looking for prints. I mean, do they usually just walk right down the middle of the path, or no. do they usually stay no. off to the side, or do they avoid paths altogether? Believe it or not, I automatically, if I come across in an area that they're, that I know they're there. I've, I've been able to prove it over and over and over, uh, but it's still a fairly rare account. Folks, we're literally, I tell people all the time, we're chasing the tooth fairy. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's it's known to be a, as a myth, but I usually go 10 to anywhere from 5 to 25 feet either side of the trail in both directions, and you'll usually find sign of them parallel in a game trail. Same mm -hmm. way with our tracking trails, they'll, they'll usually run... Uh, I just came across a, a research area that I got locked down in eastern Oklahoma uh, that they've literally wore a trail in a circle uh, 10 feet in the brush line all the way around the house. But they, they love to parallel trails. If you're on a lower trail, run halfway up the ridge line, not all the way to the ridge. Go halfway up and you'll usually see sign of them there because they don't like to silhouette themselves on a ridge line. I mean, I, I look at it the way... If you have any kind of tactical training or hunting training, think what would we do, you know, if I was in that situation. And that's usually where I find signs. But there, and that's, you know, that's that a hit so miss. That that's, makes so much sense, though. Well, if he's if 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 I'm trying to elude people, I'm going <laughs> to sit halfway up a ridge and watch that trail. But I'll always leave myself three ways to go, either up, the, I mean, uh, sideways on the ridge, sideways on the ridge or straight up over the top. But very seldom will I go straight up over the top unless there's a belly in the ridge that I can keep, you know, like a, another washout or something coming in. Uh, I'll keep trees in front of me. I'll, you know, uh, that's what I, the tree structures that I have trouble with is, that are 10 foot off a trail and are very substantially, you know, put together. I don't think these guys are going to build tree structures. Bushcraft is getting very popular, you know, and. But I, I think these guys are halfway up a ridge. They're going to be, you know, quite a ways back in the woods. But you never know. There's so many different personalities with these things. Uh, just in what I've dealt with, I've had aggressive groups. I've had passive groups. I've had groups that are downright almost friendly, you know, and f groups that will play with you. Uh, that Especially the young ones like to make noises and stuff at night. And, but genuinely, they're uh, running halfway up a ridge and... and uh, more of a tactical mindset would be the way I'd put it. Okay, that that that's definitely a lot of really good feedback that I hadn't heard yet. Um, uh, another question it does raise too is: Do you think they climb trees and they scout oh yeah. from trees? Oh okay. yeah, definitely. I mean, you think about it, and I have to say it this way: any tactical or biological advantage, they're they're a a entity of opportunity. I'll say entity because we're not for sure exactly what they are. I think they're a natural creature myself, but they are going to use any and everything because they are an upper level intelligence being. They're going to use everything to their advantage, every part of the territory. Now, I'm not saying that a, a big male like what I've seen that weighs a thousand pounds is going to climb up a, an 18 inch tree. But mm -hmm. we've seen video evidence of juveniles in trees. We've seen thermal video evidence of, of larger ones in trees. And you get up in the Pacific Northwest up there where y'all are at and on farther north, them trees are big enough and substantial enough to hold them. Yeah, That's you true. could you could pretty much put a Mack truck on top of some of the yeah. trees around here. So, yeah. Um, Cause I know, I know I don't really, I, at least I haven't heard a lot of people talking about them being up in trees, but I can't remember who we were talking about, but we were having a conversation the other day about how a lot of people don't look up. They don't. Yeah. They're constantly me, looking down and straight ahead. And they're me, and my sect, me and my folks, we're looking up, we're looking down, we're sideways looking everywhere because down here, Zach, you can attest to it, especially on these river bottoms, you better start looking up because there might be a cotton mouth up there fixing to drop on your head. They're known to do that. But mm. you just, 
I, I've always, I, I tell everybody in the woods with me, keep your head on a swivel. Mm -hmm. and, and another thing that I'm seeing that a lot of folks are not paying attention to, they always want to, I, I wonder how many times we psychologically have overlooked these guys because we're looking for something bipedal because we watched the Patterson Gimlin film. These things are just as fast or faster or just as comfortable and more comfortable on all fours than they are on two legs. Yeah. I've, I've physically seen it. I've seen mm -hmm. the tracks. I've seen the, I've, I've seen them blast through the brush and it sounded like a stinking Buffalo going through there. And wow. if they was upright. You'd be able to see them, but you know, right. the brush on the chest high. That's a very good point. Now, I also understand that they're very stealthy at the same time when they want to be. You, you, they could be moving all around you, and you wouldn't really hear them unless you were paying such extreme attention to every little possible noise you're hearing to even realize that they're there. Is that true even as well? Then, even then. You, you look at it this way. There's certain military sects. I, uh, I actually taught long-range tactical shooting and operations. In other words, I taught sniper school. Uh, so I have got a skill set that my father will tell you, that my dad will tell you, and my wife will, that's exceptional above the best. If it wasn't for me being so crippled up, I can move in the forest and you won't hear me. But that's just, if you took all of my training and all the time that I've spent in the woods, even, and I, I probably not as much as a guide, uh, you know, like a hunting guides and some of the, you guys up north, but I could I can attest that I've probably spent seven years of my life in the woods. Okay, you take something, and I am not genetically and physically perfected for the woods. I have to have clothing, I've, my, my legs, the way I walk. Mm -hmm. uh, the human body, we won't even get into all that, but springs over their toes, makes a bunch of noise. You have to change the way you physically walk to do a scout walk. These things, generation after generation after generation, have not only been genetically and biologically tuned for this, but emotionally, psychologically, and sociology, soci how you say it, sociologically, because I truly believe that the parents teach the juveniles, just like any primate, or even the orcas. So I'm telling you, I can get in the woods, I can run out in the woods, give me about an hour, and you can walk down the trail, and I'll reach out and tap you on the shoulder. I've proven it. And I'm not being arrogant, folks. It's just the truth. Anybody can do it with the right skill set and teaching. Yeah. These things, I, me and my dad have laughed about it. And I've talked to Shane. Shane's a heck of a guy in the woods. You know, there's a lot of good researchers out here that teaches me stuff in the woods. You know, it's the great researchers. But we all talk about how many times we've walked by one and he could have reached out and mm -hmm. up, spanked you on the butt and send you on down the trail. <laughs> I've got, I've got living proof. A lot of folks do with parabolic microphones of them sneaking to within 10 or 12 feet of a tent and you never know it. You never know it. Mm. Oh, wow. That's interesting. So they pretty much let their presence be known if they want to. You don't find Bigfoot. Bigfoot finds you just like Josh was saying. I truly believe that. Now, an another question I have for you is, um, and, and I believe everybody's different. Everybody would react differently. But um, you hear a lot of people saying or going out and actively searching for it or saying that they want to go searching for it and they want to see one. Um, do you think a lot of them, after they have an actual experience face-to-face -face with one, they are the same people who say, careful what you ask for, you know? Or do you honestly, think they want to just see more? Honestly, I think it's just like you said earlier. You know, each situation, you know, insinuates a different response. You know, I think depending on how the, the individual is, personality is on both ends, whether it's the human or the target species on how they react to each other. You know, I've, I've literally been in the woods and, and with guys that's never seen one. And then when they see it, they don't ever want to go back, you know, and then a lot of it i think depends on how much you see of it i mean if you get an experience like mine and an experience like carrie arnold's you know he had a terrifying experience mm -hmm. and you know w at times it, it, zach when you go out in the woods with me y'all guys come down you'll see when it starts getting pretty interesting you'll you'll see me my demeanor change because i i know what we're looking for but mm -hmm. then you uh, once again you've got folks that are drawn to the big teddy bear of the woods mm-hmm and folks, 
it's like Duke from World Bigfoot Radio says, don't hug the Wookiee. It, uh, they ain't teddy bears. <laughs> don't kiss a cotton mouth. <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> I like that. Well, that's, um, you know, that's the whole thing. You know, active researchers is a good thing. I think we have to have the boots on the ground. Yeah. I, I think that's what's going to get the breakthrough in this. I don't think it's going to be uh, uh, because science is not going to step in at this point. It's going to take boots on the ground guys to get that piece of evidence to get the scientific community to step forward. Right. So, so I've got a question here too. Let's say we're out in the woods somewhere um, and we come across what we, what looks like a Bigfoot track. What would be the best way? To, what do you do with that? Do you, you know, do you have plaster of Paris ready? Do you measure it? Do you take you're opening ready? up? What a, do you do? You're opening up in a hornet's nest there because a, a lot I'm, of folks don't, don't like nothing. me because of what I'm fixing to say. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> Let's hear it. In my personal opinion and in my personal research, I don't even carry plaster. Okay, my problem that I have being a tractor. And I've seen it happen too many times. Now, there are a lot of researchers out there that don't do this. But I will say that that over half of the folks that I've been with, when they find that cast that and they want to cast it, everybody gathers, oh, my God, look at this, look at this. And they start circling around it and doing all this. And I'm sitting back going, do y'all understand what the hell you're doing? You I was just, just thinking that. It. You ruined it. Uh, I was just thinking that because not only are they circling around uh, geeking out over this footprint, but whatever left that footprint <laughs> can can be around you somewhere well, still. No. Well, even at that, they're just destroying the other they're side. You know, right. when right. they find that one footprint, they're like, oh, my God, let's vote. And there's nothing wrong with that. I've got casts. I'm just not big into cast. I'm more into the trail. I'm going to go find the next footprint. Now, it, it, the way we do it. I have dad. Dad's just as, you know, he's a pretty good tracker too. He'll, he'll tell you that he's not as good as me, but he's good. And, or even like with Tex, if we go and we find a track like that, we mark it with a flag and that we okay. can get into procedural stuff like that. And then I go find the next sign and I mark it with a flag. By the time I'm done on a trail, it looks like something off a of CSI. You know, those All little, right. the little <laughs> final All flag. Right. I like yeah. that. You don't got the little uh, Whataburger numbers, you know? <laughs> but, but the reason we do that is, and we document it, and I've got a few, a uh, couple of videos out, and we're fixing to do some more. You can literally take a camera and start walking that trail, and you can see the trail as it's going. So people on the on the video side of things, and on the like you, see what I'm looking for. I'm okay. going through telling you what I'm looking for, but you see the physical trail. Then you see the stride marks then you see this you know the step count and it's a big picture together absolutely it's like right reading a book you know that that one track that, that you're wanting to take the cast is is just the title or just one chapter i want the whole book you know yeah well that, that's that's definitely a huge question um now the next question i have it kind of came to my mind because of what happened to us this morning um we, we live in the city area. We're, we're by mountains, but we're not in the mountains. So uh, what I'm about to explain is not a common occurrence. In fact, it's the first time I've seen it happen. Um, this morning when I was stepping out back to have my cup of coffee, we had a deer hanging out in our backyard. And um, we filmed it. We actually put a video up on our shorts channel. We'll be mm -hmm. releasing soon. But um we saw the deer and it was kind of hanging around. And then it took off and ran across Main Street, took off down the road. Well, right before this show started, I went to step out back again and the deer was standing at our pond, drinking out of the pond mm. water. And then um, kind of going back into the back area of our backyard where the bushes and everything were and it was eating leaves and stuff. Um, Marianne mentioned it was probably because of the drought. Now, do, how, how does the drought affect yeah, real good question. That's, that's, question. that's a great one. I was thinking uh, too. I, I do have to answer one question that was brought up. Uh, De Quinto asked me if I would shoot one if I came on one. I am strictly no kill, no interference. When we go in, we don't call blast much. We leave a small footprint. I do carry because, as Zach knows, he's farther south than I am. We've got hogs down here that's bigger than a German Shepherd. 
and they will rip you. You get out in the woods. There's snakes. There's everything else. Plus, with my wife and when my wife and my, my dog goes, I carry to protect them. And now, if, if one was to charge me or charge my family, yeah. But I am strictly a no kill. We're a we're a no interference. We don't even we don't even bait food or nothing. Uh, we don't believe in that. But in the sense of the drought, these things are very natural. They're more natural than us. They have over a period of time, millennia or or however long they've been in existence on whoever created them, live naturally in their surroundings where we change our surroundings to suit us. So. Of course, they're going to follow just, I believe, just like the First Nations people did. They're going to follow the prey. They're going to follow. But I also think that they have a, a higher semblance of uh, intelligence that they don't delete the the aspects of one area. They'll move around within a certain area so they're not depleting their, their mm -hmm. stock. I mm -hmm. believe they're as smart as we are. But definitely move with the drought. Like down here, when when it gets hot and real hot in the summer, I don't see a lot of tracks very far from the rivers. They stay mm -hmm. close to the rivers and the lakes and stuff, just so I think so they can kind of hunker down and and they seem to be a little bit less, um, how would we say, apt to move around in the summer. Also, mm. well, interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, it was just a big question in my mind because I'm seeing deer and I'm thinking of all these other animals that are coming down off the mountain because of it. So <clears throat> I didn't know if they had their own like un underwater caves. I don't know if they had I've certain heard areas. That. Yeah. No, I have. Uh, I actually heard it for the first time. You know, I've been noodling these rivers down here for all my life, you know, and I heard a, a fella. Like people, noodling? Yeah. Yeah, noodling. Yeah. I'm not time. like afraid to get an alligator, you know. <laughs> oh, I've been. Uh, I've. You, you can ask some of the boys from the Southern Bigfoot Alliance. It don't bother me to jump out of a canoe into a swamp with alligators and everything else in the water. The only thing that really scares me, spiders don't scare me. Snakes. I'm terrified of snakes because I've been bit over 14 times. Oh my and, gosh! But uh, I have in, in saying what I was saying about the getting the caves. I believe that they would use it. Anything that we would use. They'll use. And uh, I was listening to uh, Bear King. You know, he's kind of popular with uh, some of the culture, uh, the Bigfoot outlaws. And he was talking about how they would get up under root balls and stuff up on the rivers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not, a lot of that's washout, you know, where the water would come around mm -hmm. underneath and then wash underneath. And I, mm -hmm. But I got to thinking about that. And one day when we was out noodling, I was like, you know what? I'm going to crawl up in there and see. And I crawled up in there and you get all that damp dirt and the overhang above you. People can't see you. And it right. was like 20, 30 degrees cooler. And then if you need to, if the water's deep enough, do like an old alligator does and just right off out in the water. But you could lay up underneath there for all day long and be comfortable. Hmm. That's that's a very good point. And I know what you're talking about. I've seen a bunch of those. Mm. Yeah. yeah the the washout is. Yeah. 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 I'm watching the chats and people are talking about noodling. And yeah. noodling. <laughs> <laughs> that did mention something about, uh, uh, wouldn't that be proof? Yeah. Uh, I guess that's the first thing that we'll get out. Us at P3, at poor boys, we call it. Um, we're not really out to prove it. We know their existence. Uh, what we're out, what I'm honestly out to do is to assist in the conservation as aspect of it. I know people say they don't need protection because they've been protecting themselves for thousands of years. Well, that's true, but I'm, I'm into it for the knowledge base and the, and the contribution to the yeah. conservation of them. I mean, I'm a big nature conservationist well, anyway, but that right there kind of leads up to a question. I, I tend to ask a lot of people and I even asked it down, down there in Brown Springs too. Uh, do you believe that there's, I don't want to say secret society because that's not the word I'm trying to find, but a, uh, I guess it's a group of people worldwide, of course, trying to keep these things under wraps. So if somebody finds something, um, quickly be able to diffuse any proof that might. I like how you put that a secret <laughs> society instead of the government. Yeah. <laughs> because. Honestly, being at the level in the military that I was and still hanging around, you know, higher level law enforcement and, and military personnel, I don't think 
if there is a secret agency, it's it's so far buried black that the, mm-hmm. the general populace of the government, the governments, they're too busy having their, for lack of better terms, their pissing contest to worry about Bigfoot. I do believe that if the existence thereof Sasquatch in the past, now here's the key point in the past would have been brought out mainstream that it would have changed everything that religion and our sociological teachings, even in the, in the whole evolutionary thing would, it would totally blow that out of the water. But now we're getting past that. I mean, we literally just got confirmation from the government that there are unidentified. Hey, it's a big, it's a big step. Unidentified flying objects. We literally had the Pope come out and say that he would bless alien species. So the knowledge base is there. So I think there could be a secret society or a group of individuals that want, because we've seen some crazy stuff in the woods, even government style law enforcement, you know, uh, roll up on us. And I just, I don't go there because of my military background. And, and I, re, I tell people flat out, I don't do this conspiracy things. I don't speak against our country. It's the greatest government, the greatest country in the world. I fought hard and bled hard. A lot of my friends died just de- defending that right for me to say that. I'm not, I don't do the government thing. But I think there could be somebody or situational awareness, whatever you want to call it, trying to kind of squash it. Because there's too many people having too many weird things happening with hair samples and and evidence yeah interesting well i want to jump i want to jump in real quick right there and say that i wanted to thank you for your service thank you for doing what you did and thank you for putting what you, on the line what you put on the line because i don't know if you hear that enough but the gratitude that comes from people like me and people like marianne and zach our gratitude for everything that you sacrifice is enormous and i just want to make sure you Thank you. You, that. you know, we as veterans, we talk about that a bunch. You know, they say, thank you for your service. How do you respond for that? Respond to that. And I heard a, an active duty Marine Corps sergeant, uh, master sergeant, actually give the best response. And I've been telling everybody this veteran say it. Thank you for the opportunity to serve. If it wasn't for folks like y'all, mm-hmm. it wouldn't have been worth it for us. Mm-hmm. You know, it was uh, we haven't had the draft since the 70s. 60s and 70s it's all voluntary you know it's but uh, i just tell people thank you for the opportunity to be able to you know we are in the greatest country on the where else in the world can you get together like this on the internet when people like in russia are having to pay like ten dollars a minute to get on the internet mm. the liberties that we have but <clears throat> dang bigfoot Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, let's uh, on the Bigfoot topic. You know, if if somebody was going for a, a hiking trip, or if they were going for a, a jog down a trail, <clears throat> and they had suspicion that there may be something going on nearby, um, what would you advise to them? Would you advise them to stop and turn around and head back the other way? Would you advise them to just keep going and just keep their eyes open? You know, I always tell people, even, even folks that's not been in the woods, 90% of us have been around enough to know when we get that eerie feeling, mm-hmm. you know, when, like, I'm sure y'all been walking down a street or something, something just don't set right. When you get to that level, yeah, vacate. But I've always told people, if you hear something in the woods, if you hear something, stop, listen, don't make a big issue about it. The more you let them know that you know they're there, I'm a true believer that depending on the group, the less they're going to let you know that they know that they're there. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Mm-hmm. If, if you do hear something, I always tell people, don't jerk your head around real quick or nothing because sudden movements exude two things, aggression or fear. If you're any kind of a predator, if you show aggression, they get territorial. If you show fear, they attack because of the flight or flight movement. So mm-hmm. if you move slowly, keep your eyes open and, and never run. And, and folks, once again, I'm going to say this, and, and I noticed that Annie and Laney's on, and they'll laugh about this. Don't scream. 
<laughs> drives me nuts. I, I mean, if you're going to let people know, scream for a reason. But voices. <laughs> Zach, you being from the area you're from, how many times do you have a big old dog in your backyard and somebody screams real loud and he almost goes aggressive? You know, it, it, to me, we don't know what those noises, and that's the reason I don't do a lot of call blasting and I don't do a lot of hooping and hollering because I'm we don't know what we're telling them. I'm guilty of that. When, you know, you might be going out there and telling him, hey, come here, I'm going to stomp a mud hole in you. Or you might be going out there <laughs> saying, come here, I want to get me some ooh la la, you know. You might have a 10 foot tall, I'll say it, horny ape man. <laughs> the bigger they are, the harder they fall. That's what I'm saying. You saw David and Goliath, right? But, yeah, <laughs> we, we just don't know what we're saying, you know. I, I exactly. Truly, I truly believe that a more casual, slow approach easing through the woods, observing. That's the big thing for me, observing. You know how many times I've seen researchers walking around in the woods without a notepad? Hmm. Even in wilderness survival and land navigation, that is two of your most important, and survival, two of the most important things you can have is a notepad and a pen of paper. Paper makes good fire starter. A pen actually can be used as a weapon or for water collection or water storage in minute amounts, but it works. If you have a notepad and a piece of paper along with your cameras and stuff, jot some notes down. Because you know how many 90% of the time when you do see the big fella, everything that you was thinking about there prior of, throw it out the window. Yeah. Mm, yeah. That's true. Oh, yeah, I can definitely I, I see can, that. Uh-huh. Yeah. If and, I mean, even just with the deer back here, we're like, oh, what are, what, what do we do? Where's the camera? Oh my gosh. And do we watch it? What do we do? I <laughs> yeah. was just a deer. I, I was, me and Carrie was talking about this and he, <laughs> he mentioned it and I really liked it. If you have the equipment and the, the uh, knowledge and the amount of time run a camera 24 seven, it might catch something. Well, what do you think about those uh, trail cams too? Strapping the trail cams all over the place. Do you think those are helpful, or do do they they sense that they're there? They know they're there, so they avoid them. I'm going to reiterate because we haven't talked and we've been haven't said it in about ten fifteen minutes. This is all in my personal opinion. This is through direct observation and interaction with myself and or people that I trust. Uh, I believe trail cameras can be done. I believe if they're done properly. Uh, if I was to walk into your room and uh, strap a, a can of tuna fish to your wall with a piece of duct tape, you'd know it was there, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. If I walked into your house and moved your moved your clock over six inches, you'd know it was there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was just talking about this to, to text and Gary, uh, the senior, your dad, yeah. about that. And I was like, it makes sense. You're, you're in the woods. 24 7 seven days a week all the time forever yeah. since you've been alive you know every footstep you know everything that's out of place you know if something yep. changes if the game trail changes you know you know if things change you you, you see that we get turned around in, in a second absolutely like someone like me well you, around, you, know? you look at our you look at our family farm where senior lives now and i was raised up my whole life it's where i played cowboys and indians and then soldiers and folks i don't mean that in derogatory sense that's just what we played mm -hmm. uh you know and soldiers on and then hunting and fishing i know me and my father knows every tree every rock every lap and i haven't been there in 20 years but i still know it i can you could blindfold me and I can walk a three mile section around our place and still no get home. And we're dad's down there more than I am, but we're, we're, we are distracted with family and jobs and going here and going there. These folks literally focus on that right there. So we mm. would be stupid to think that, you know, they might, I do know that some animals see IR. We proved that my mm -hmm. dog sees IR. I took an IR light and he tracked it on the wall, you know, not scientifically, but we know. But I think that they, because I've seen some pretty good trail camera footage. I've got a pretty good trail camera picture that, uh, that we ended up doing. I call it the predator thing. We put trail cameras facing trail cameras and facing tra trail cameras. And, uh, we, we caught a pretty decent anomaly. But I believe that they can be helpful. Anything that can up our game, try it. You know, it, what works for one might not work for another, and it's all situational. That's true. 
That's, That's a good point. I, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, yeah. We are getting closer to the 10 minute mark. Uh, so uh, if people do have questions, feel free to start dropping them now and we'll be happy to ask and uh, get some answers for you guys as well. It looks like Laura has one right out of the gate. What made me get started in Bigfoot? You know, I'll be honest with you. I, at a young age, very young age, I, the, I had a stuffed Bigfoot this tall. No way. They make, they make those? <laughs> Back in the 70s and 80s, they did. My, I, I can't remember if my dad got it for me while he was driving truck or something. Bigfoot has been a part of our family for generations, you know, huh. because of the First Nations and and you know all of that and and especially with my later on when i found out about my mongolian heritage you know they're the alma is all over over there you know yes, in mongolia. It is. and uh so i can honestly say that it, it's been a staple of my my earliest childhood is is of my grandmother and them with the, you know the forest folks and the boogers you know don't go out there if you go out at dark you better not get past the light very far even as we got older and where i was raised and my dad can attest to it if they came out and honked that horn three times even because we had a lot of property you'd be back there on the back of the property playing if you didn't make it granddad would always come honk the horn 10 to 15 20 minutes before sunset and if you didn't make it back to the, and the senior would do the same thing. If you didn't make it back before dark and they had to come looking for you, they was trailing your butt home with a belt the whole time. And we always, that was a, a rule, you know, well, mm. why was the rule? And they'd always say, don't let the boogers get you. Huh. So down in the South, we, everybody says we call them boogers, you know, but. I call them boogers. Well, yeah. Zach calls them wood boogers and now she's started yeah. calling them wood boogers. I had so. never heard that before. <laughs> I hadn't. I had never heard that term ever. The legend of Boggy Creek. I actually, Falk is one of my more active places that we like to research because my wife's family is from like an hour from Falk down in Minden, Louisiana. And I've literally been in there with the Southern Bigfoot Alliance guys and we've had trees pushed over. We've, I found, I followed a trackway for over three quarters of a mile down there. Mm. I believe that that's prime area because it's all swamp and they love the water down here. But anything where, where? is going to follow the water. Where is that? Falk, Arkansas. Great. It's right on the corner, right uh, uh, southeast, or a little bit of Texarkana, Texas. Right down in Arkansas. Right there okay. off 20? You go 20 and back north. Oh, wow. Hmm. Right. Dude, That's you want to do a trip to Falk, you let me know, and me and Pops will come down there, and I've got a, a, a lunar boat. I'll put you, I will put you on the site of the old man's cabin, the swamp man's cabin in Fal in Mercer Bayou. There's a cabin out there. No, it's just the hill. Can just the I hill. go? <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna yeah. be out there soon. <laughs> but, but, you know the old man, uh, uh, Shorty. Uh, well, not Shorty, but the the young man crab trees. Uh, you know the old man that was. They always said was. Oh, there ain't nothing in these swamps. We was actually able to find where that cabin was. Hmm. And like Keith Crabtree, one of the greatest men out there. And Keith, I hope you listen to this. If not, I'll send you a message. Keith is one of the Crabtrees, one of the ones that had the sightings. He played the Sasquatch, the arm that come in the window. He played it. Very good friend of ours down here. He's all over the Bigfoot community. Great guy. Oh, just so awesome. Great. A wealth of knowledge. That's one you ought to have on your show if you can get him on. That's a wealth of knowledge right there. All right. We'll have to track him down. Yes, for sure. Uh, I think I saw another one. Uh, yes. Was it Trudy? Trudy's. Yep. Says Gary, not asking for specifics, but what area do you live in, grew up in? South central to southeastern Oklahoma, all the way into Arkansas. If you split Arkansas and from Hot Springs, go west all the way to I-35. That's that's you might as well say that's my area because I ran all throughout there as kids, but uh. I, but our farm and stuff is, I don't want to give out specifics, but is in South Central Oklahoma. But we spent a lot of time in Clayton area, Hanovia. Uh, my wife, of course, being from northeast, northwestern Louisiana. Uh, along, I call it that Red River Basin. Uh, mm. From the Red River all the way. I live currently in uh, Central Oklahoma. Uh, but 
I'm on that Red River. I've been running that Red River since that Red River runs deep in this bad boy. <laughs> and, and you actually had quite a bit of history here in Utah as well, though. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I left the left the military, and and uh, let's just say that uh, not having the best relationship with my family, and and always wanting to travel, I got to work in the oil field, and ended up moving to Utah. And lived in the uh, Unica Basin for almost five years. And uh, Utah literally almost killed me. Well, it did kill me, technically. But uh, I do love that area. I, I love Salt Lake. I love uh, a lot of Bigfoot up there, too, in the mountains. You go Ogden North. Uh, I've got the. I need to send you the uh, uh, GPS coordinates on uh, Dead Man's Canyon where they had all the sightings. Yeah, because yeah. we'll go. We will. We'll oh, go. yeah, it's not. <laughs> An hour from you, if that. Even better. <laughs> we'll go and camp out. <laughs> Zach, did you have a question? Me? Uh, no, I was just posting um, tip, uh, not tip, uh. <laughs> P3. But, yeah, P3. Uh, and, and answer, Trudy, uh, Midwest City, well, I'm in Dell City. Mm. Mm. I got you. Well, I, I do, um, while we wait for any last-minute questions to come in, I, I do want to express my gratitude of you being on the show and taking the time to speak yeah. with us today. Uh, not just today, but we actually talked a, a, a little bit a few days ago um, off yeah. air and got to know each other and talk a little bit back and forth. And and I really do appreciate um, your viewpoint. I do appreciate the fact that it's like, this is my opinion. This is my experience. This is how I perceive it, but that's just my take on it. And yeah, you know, I appreciate that you're not stating things as factual, unless they are stacks. You know, if I drop a rock, does it hit the ground? Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Depends. <laughs> it depends on what's between the rock and the ground, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, right, depending on the perception and the angle. You know, it's I yeah. I flat out I tell people all the time that. There's so many, and, and, and y'all know by now, because we all kind of hang with the same, but I'm kind of re a recluse myself. But uh, w this little network uh, that we got going on of, I'm, I'm so sick of the the hate. and the, I'm an expert in this. I'm an expert in that. I mean, literally, folks, we're chasing something that has not even been biologically proven to be in existence. There are no experts. We have a lot of very knowledgeable people. Don't take me wrong. You know, if there was an expert in the fact, it would be the late, great John Bendernagel. It would be Jeffrey Meldrum, people that have doctorate educations. And I know there's only people that disagree with me and say, oh, my God, they're dumb as a box of rocks. Well, what makes you any of us an expert? Yeah. That's yeah. a very good point. Yeah, absolutely. Very good point. The only facts you know is what you saw. Absolutely. And even and then I you could trick them. yourself. Do y'all understand how long, even after I had my sighting, physical sighting <laughs> at 18 inches, how I questioned my sanity? Mm -hmm. People don't understand. You know, I, I, I question stuff to this day. You look at my videos now it, and your text will tell you, uh, my dad will tell you, I am one of the most, for a believer, I'm not a believer, I'm a knower. I know something's out there, mm -hmm. but I'm one of the most skeptical people. I, I question myself. I question every track. I question every tree break. I question every, for the simple fact that it's all in perception. Mm -hmm. And I can see how it'd be easy to get carried away with what, you know, we, we create what we want to find, you know, you, Absolutely. everybody has, has their own point of view and you're going to find what you want to see. So Absolutely. that's a, that's a great. Uh, and the mind can play mighty tricks. No, yeah. I was yeah, if mine can play uh, tricks on you. Well, it's easy. I mean, Absolutely. you could do a show, and then you could do a cut and a cut and have a different colored shirt on with every cut, and nobody would notice it, you know. Um, so the mind's only going to perceive so much of what it's visually taking in. Absolutely. You mm -hmm. know? And you hit a real good point before we leave. You know, I hear a lot of people saying, the video, the this, the that. With the technology, and they made a question, with all the, the trackers and the trail cameras that we had, how come we don't have... Well, folks, there's some awful good photos and video out there, but with the technology that we have, it's easy to reproduce that. I believe myself, my personal, is in the experiences. 
I, I like listening to those stories. I get 90% of my information from multiple eyewitnesses. And then I take the similarities out of each one of them, which is getting harder now because we have so many more podcasts and all that information is out there. Mm -hmm. But I, I get mine a lot from the impressions of people, even in the paranormal. I don't believe in technology a whole lot. I, when I take a camera in the woods, I'm taking a camera in the woods not to capture the Bigfoot. I'm taking a, ca a camera in the woods to capture me capturing the Bigfoot. You know, when I, I'm going, I'm like, we well, was talking about Josh, <laughs> I'm going to film everybody chasing, not the chase. You know, I'm filming the chase, not the. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Man, no, you see, I don't know if you want to be with me because I'm like, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry, don't worry Zach. I'll be that camera guy and you could just do what you do and I'll just stand behind I, you. I'm telling faster. you, I've been wanting to do one for a long time. I want to do a Blair Witch Bigfoot. Yeah, just just to get out and and scare people, and, and because mine, I, I I want to find a cabin, an abandoned building, or anything out in the middle of the woods where there is Bigfoot sightings or whatever. To me, just recently, maybe a month or two ago, that has been like my ultimate like goal to do because I get to explore and be able to have that creepy factor of having that you might run into a Bigfoot. You don't know. I mean, you don't all, know what's going to happen. All I'm going to say is, Zach, get with me after the show. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't got to go very far, brother. <laughs> well, don't, don't exclude us. We drive. Don't drive anywhere. <laughs> you, you, know, anyway. you know, like Texas, you know, he just put together this last weekend, you know, uh, doing having everybody down there. And I, like I said, I got to apologize for missing it because I really wanted to go. And, uh, but I think it get a bunch of us together and just do a, I call it shooting from the hip. You know, you just get out in the woods, get a bunch of cameras going and just, just go for the search. And if you find something, you find something. I'm not going to break my heart. You know how many, that, that was one thing that they asked. How many times have I seen? I've been researching for 27 years. I've been researching full time now for five years, literally full time. I said for when I'm doing construction work, I'm researching and doing shows. And I've had two class B's and one class A. People like, you know, John uh, Green went years without seeing any, period. Hmm. What did that say? I couldn't even read it. So he had to try randonauting on Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, we, we are at the end of the hour. Again, uh, thank you for everybody who tuned in and was watching the show. On, and uh, I'm, I guarantee you enjoyed it because it, how can you not? That was uh, awesome. To get more uh, information about Gary and P3 Productions, the links are down in the descriptions below. Go check him out. Do a binge watch. Watch all the stuff. And you you also do a regular show as well. Is that correct? Yes. We uh, well semi regular right now since we're uh, I'm working with Spaced Out Radio. But we try to release a show every other week or at least every week. We are on us now that I'm kind of tied to the studio because it's so hot. I probably we'll probably do some live stuff. So see, there'll be a lot more stuff coming up. I'm 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 looking forward to having you guys. You know, on my show, I'd like to talk. We don't just talk Bigfoot on P3. We talk everything. We, we just did All a show right. podcasting. Had a podcaster's panel last week, released this week. But, uh, yeah, just reach out to us. If you have any reports or anything, you can catch me on uh, uh, Facebook. Just type in P3 Productions or the easiest way to do it, I tell people and they laugh at me, type in Graveyard Cowboy. That was the only thing I could find that was so random that it, it would tag it in. <laughs> that is well, pretty random. <laughs> both of your links to your YouTube channel and your Facebook is in the description below. So if awesome. anybody's awesome. looking for that, go over there, show them some love, let them know that Tippa TV sent you guys, and just spread that love. Spread yeah. that awareness. Absolutely. Well, right, we're going gonna to go ahead and close this out. So again, thank you, everybody, for tuning in and watching. Thank you, Rooted Expedition, for co-hosting. And thank you, Gary, for being our guest this week. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you, Bye. Gary. Bye. Bye.